So, Talison. Elliot. Why were my notes too afraid to ask out this book? I don't know. They lacked the spine to do it. <laughs> I hate it. You shouldn't have agreed to do this podcast with me. Okay, but the podcast was my idea to begin with. Yeah, and it was a mistake to invite me. We'll see about that. <laughs> Welcome to the first chapter episode. I think chapter works best. It's kind of cliche, but... Eh, this is the first draft anyway. Welcome to the first chapter of Dykes Arn Books. We're never getting monetized with a name like that. <laughs> Now, do you want to be the first to introduce yourself, or shall I? I'll go first. You've done most of the talking. I'm Talison. My pronouns are he, him. And I am Elliot, or Leo. And my pronouns are she and her. And what are your qualifications for doing a <laughs> book review podcast? I don't know if we can call it qualifications. Only have about three quarters of an English degree. I mean, that's still more than me. I have zero quarters of an English degree. I just really like reading. And that's the important qualification, I think. Yeah, I think so as well. So, shall we begin talking about our first book? Well, it's your pick for the book this week, so why don't you introduce it? Of course. Today we are going to be covering Into the Drowning Deep by Mira Grant. She's better known as Seanan McGuire. Mira Grant is her pen name when writing horror novels. And yes, that means that this is in fact a horror novel. So we're going to get into our content warnings for today's episode. Go right ahead. Content warnings for the book are as follows. Animal death. Mentions of abusive parents. Gore and mutilation. So much gore. So much gore, yes. This is a monster slasher flick if in you, novel form. If you don't like gore, definitely don't read this book. Near drowning. Hospital scenes. Descriptions of claustrophobic spaces. Mentions of systemic ableism. Mild sexual content. Gun violence. And controlling ex-partners. I think that covers pretty much everything. So if this isn't your cup of tea, that is totally fine. Now, without further ado, I'm going to read the blurb for this book, just to give you a little bit of an idea as to what this book is about. And that way, if you find yourself realizing, hey, that sounds really interesting, you can stop here and go and read the book yourself, which we highly recommend. Please do. Shauna McGuire is one of my favorite authors. Yes, you love Shauna McGuire. I do. I want to be her when I grow up. <laughs> Seven years ago, the Atagardis set off on a voyage to the Mariana Trench to film a mockumentary bringing to life ancient sea creatures of legend. It was lost at sea with all hands. Some have called it a hoax, others have called it a tragedy. Now a new crew has been assembled. Some seek to validate their life's work, some seek the greatest hunt of all, some seek the truth. But for ambitious young scientist Victoria Stewart, this is a voyage to uncover the fate of the sister she lost. Whatever the truth may be, it will only be found below the waves. One thing that I do want to note, there is actually a prequel novella about the Atagardas called Rolling in the Deep, but you do not have to read that before you read this book. It is also excellent, but it is not required reading for this. Now, shall we get into the book itself? dive right in so to speak i don't know if diving is a good idea with this one but let's go ahead <laughs> well first we should start off by talking about some of the more important characters in this our protagonist for the book is victoria stewart she is a science student you heard about her in the blurb she specializes in acoustic marine biology she is our main protagonist and she's the one searching for her lost sister her friend and lab partner is Luis Martinez. He is tall, gawky, and rich. He specializes in oceanic megafauna. He's a cryptozoologist. He's a cryptozoologist. He's yeah. a himbo. He is a himbo, except not strong enough to be a himbo. 
Theodore Blackwell is the closest thing to an antagonist this book has. I mean, the true antagonist of this book is climate change and corporate greed. If anyone is the antagonist antagonist, it's Theo's boss. But Theo is the face of the enemy. Dr. Gillian Toth, who is married to Theodore Blackwell, she is a sirenologist and pretty much a laughingstock of most of the scientific community in this book. It was her ideas that led Imagine to film their mockumentary and her ideas that pointed them to the Marianas Trench. She's also, like, really hot. You're incorrigible. Yes. <laughs> and then there is Olivia Sanderson, who is Imagine's shiny new media personality. She's kind of anxious around other people, and she's on the current voyage to film for the follow-up documentary. She is the new person with Anne's job, and we will put a pin in that and come back to it. Yes, absolutely. We're going to come back to that. Before we get into the actual book, I do want to call out one thing that I like a lot about the author's note, which is about the use of American Sign Language in this book and the differentiation between American Sign Language, which has its own unique grammatical structure, and signing exact English, which is how the book represents most of the sign language in the text, just because it's easier to read. It is a very good author's note. Yeah. I like the thought and care about disability representation that that demonstrates. So, let's actually dive in now. Probably still not a good idea. There is a thing I want to talk about as we're getting into the start of this, which is the quotations at the beginning of every single zone in this book. This book is divided into acts that are labeled as zones. It's very clever. And each of the zones is based on a layer of the ocean. It starts with surface and then goes lower. But for each one, they have a couple of small quotes and then two larger quotes. And they give a lot of world building for this, which is very interesting. I love the world building that's in it. I think that sometimes it can be a little bit much to do so many quotes. Well, here's the thing. I read those quotes, specifically the longer sections. It's like the short quotes are largely just providing a really tight, snappy look into two characters that feature heavily in the upcoming sections' worldviews. They're, they're tight, they're clever. The larger sections are a little bit found footage and a little bit referential to early epistolary science fiction and horror, like Dracula. And I do appreciate it. It's not that I dislike it, it's just that sometimes I want to get to the next part and it drags a little bit for me. I, I do still like them. This book starts out with a bunch of little prologue vignettes, sort of found footage, like you were saying earlier, where it starts with Tori waiting for her sister to come home. We get some details establishing the character and just how much Tori loves the sea. It is her first love and it has taken her sister from her. That's something that she kind of struggles with, balancing her love for the sea with the fact that she is haunted by the loss of her sister at a young age. Then after that, the next little prologue is more found footage. This time, actual found footage, where they're describing the footage that was found in the wake of the Atagratis disaster. And it is the first time we get a description of the monster for this slasher flick, yeah. which is Mermaids. Surprise, surprise. It's a book about killer mermaids. Yes, which I love. I love mm -hmm. that it is a book about killer mermaids. There need to be more books about killer mermaids. It's very well done, this little snippet into the horror of what happened on this ship without revealing too much. Then we get to another prologue and... This is the weakest one, in my opinion. This one goes on to describe this fuckboy on a <laughs> private yacht out on the Marianas Trench and then getting attacked. It's sort of just going to show, yes, the mermaids are real. Yes, they're still active in this area. I, It just feels like it drags on too much for me. So here's how I read this. This book is very much a love letter to monster movies and grindhouse films. And this specific section is the part where they establish how dangerous the creature is and that the thing that is going to be hunting the cast is already in the house, so to speak. 
I feel like the previous section has already done a fantastic job of setting up how dangerous they are. And this section just feels like more of it. And with characters that have no tie to the rest of the story. But that's kind of the point, because that proves that the monsters, the mermaids, are indiscriminate. They don't care. Agree to disagree for this one. Okay, but you're still wrong. <laughs> that is not what agree to disagree means. And so we get to Zone 1 Pelagic, which starts out with more quotes. I do actually really like the longer quotes from Dr. Toth's transcripts from her lectures. Mm. Those are very interesting to me. Dr. Toth is a very interesting character. Dr. Toth is one of the characters in this book that I wish to study like a bug. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of characters that I want to study under a microscope. We jump forward to July 28th, 2022. This book is a near future science fiction book and it's set in 2022 and we're reading this in 2023. <laughs> Which makes it a little bit funny. It is a little bit funny that we're reading this a year after it's supposed to happen and <laughs> oh god... I wish we had some of the stuff that they have in this. Maybe not the killer mermaids. No, not the killer mermaids, of course. The book opens following Tori on her summer job on a sightseeing vessel. And this goes to hammer home the point of how much Tori loves the sea through mm -hmm. descriptions of how she is viewing other people who are experiencing the sea, some of them for the first time because they come from landlocked states. And then she absolutely fucks it up by <laughs> going on about how orcas are inhumanely kept captive. And absolutely, that's... Put a pin in this. We'll come back to it. <laughs> Put a pin in that. Yes, it's true. Orcas are very inhumanely kept captive. Like, it is so inhumane. Probably not the best thing for her employment, though. No. As we soon find out, because... Immediately the next chapter, she is fired from this job. And I, I love it how she starts with, what do you mean fired? It's like, Tori. You know exactly what you did. You know exactly what you did. You're a scientist. You're really smart. You know why you've been fired. <laughs> not to mention, you've been warned about this before. Like, this was not her first time. <laughs> Okay, but Tori has no impulse control, as we will see several times. <laughs> we will see several times, yes. There is a passage in this section of Tori and her boss talking right after he's let her go that I want to read for you because it really hammers home exactly what Tori is all about. When she looked back to Jay, he was watching her, a strangely gentle look in his eyes. You still chasing mermaids, Vic? he asked. I've never been chasing mermaids, she said. I've only ever been chasing Anne. I also marked that. <laughs> so we follow her home to go speak to her parents. They quickly suss out that she's been fired. Yeah. Her mother is kind of upset about her wasting her potential. <laughs> and I love her father. He is dad of the year. Yeah, We get one scene of her parents and it's a really good one. Yes, they have fantastic dialogue between the two of them. And I just love her father. Her father is great. And so after that, they go out to have pizza together, which now I'm going to start wanting pizza now that I'm talking <laughs> about this. And their dinner is interrupted by her lab partner, Luis Martinez. I love how Sean and McGuire describe certain characters. Mm -hmm. Allow me to read just the beginning of this. Luis Martinez was the sort of tall that made basketball coaches sit up and take notice, and the sort of skinny that made those same coaches sit back down in despair. <laughs> I love her descriptions, and that is why, of course, that Luis cannot be a himbo. That's fair. <laughs> but yes, you're right. The way that she weaves things about personality into the physical description is brilliant. Lewis hands over some documents to Victoria, and these are some fairly important readings from one of their undersea recording stations. And these recordings show a large vessel at the bottom of the sea, which... Engines don't work like that. And this is some very good setup of the mimicry. So they finish up their dinner quickly and then head back to their shared lab. 
We learn a bit more about each of them and why they're pursuing their goals. We know that Tori is searching for answers about her sister. Yeah. Lewis, he's a cryptid hunter. He is. So the two of them head back to their lab. They see that the door to their lab has been left open, which... Although Lewis is kind of an airhead sometimes, he knows that he did not leave this open. So they're nervous because somebody has clearly broken into their lab. Lewis volunteers to go first. He gets shot down. Because Tori is the only one of them who's actually done self-defense. So they enter and come face to face with Theodore Blackwell, the right hand to James Golden, who's the medium mogul who controls Imagine. He's kind of the lackey that we see throughout this. Yeah. He's basically the like the right hand man and the guy who gets sent to do all the dirty work. And he's an ass a lot of the time. I do love him. He's fascinating. But he's also very much an ass. <laughs> And now Blackwell is here to ask them if they want to join the expedition that is going back to the Marianas Trench to see what they can find there. The plot has entered the chat. Yes. Now we go to meet Dr. Jillian Toth, who is giving a lecture on mermaids at Berkeley and dealing with the heckler in the crowd. I'm going to say this repeatedly, probably, but she is hot. Of course you are. Much like myself, she's on the larger side, but even larger than I am, like, big built as well. Yeah, she's not a woman you want to fuck with. Mm. Down. <laughs> My favorite description of her is, Her admirer said she was beautiful, confident, and clever. Her detractor said she was fat and loud and took up too much space. All of them were, within their limited spheres, correct. I love that. I, I, As someone who is fat and loud and takes up too much space, I love that. I love her. It, it's a very good description. Throughout her teaching, she's dealing with this heckler and just, it's clear that she deals with this kind of thing quite frequently because she's easily putting it down. <laughs> Theo is in attendance at this and later when she goes back to her office, he is there. These two, they're married on paper. They never really finalized having a divorce, even though they're mostly divorced. Their relationship is the kind of relationship that you could write a sociology case study on. And they're not the only one with the relationship you can write a thesis on. We'll stick we'll a note to that. In that one. There is one thing about their first interaction I do want to call out specifically because it speaks to something that Shauna McGuire does in a lot of her work that I adore. While telling Theo to please get the fuck out of my office, Jillian Toth makes this comment. Are you planning to leave like a nice little corporate shill or do you need me to contact security? Because I'd love to contact security. You never need to get me another birthday present if you make me contact security. It's great. I that love it. kind of sass is very characteristic of her work. Specifically, that sass paired with the kind of expert in her field, slightly mad scientist, tired of your shit older woman, is a character trope that Shauna McGuire uses all the time. And it always makes me happy to see it. One thing that I want to bring up is the descriptions of Theo from Dr. Toss perspective and mm -hmm. how much he has changed from when she married him because yeah. the two of them were once like greenpeace warriors riding the waves fighting whaling vessels with harpoon in hand and theo had an accident and ended up disabled yes this is a disabled villain he's far from the only disabled character in the book as well as he's done really well mm -hmm. but when speaking about him Dr. Toth describes him as a complete stranger in his skin. And that plays to the themes of mimicry that we see throughout all this book and how mimicry is dangerous. You know, I didn't pick up on that. I have one up on you then. <laughs> but yeah, that plays to the themes throughout the book of mimicry equals danger. I think in a way, it also kind of plays to the idea of being haunted by ghosts, because we never see who Theo was when they were young and in love, except through Jillian's memories in the sections where she's the point of view character. 
and that man that she used to love is haunting their marriage. She even says that her husband died more or less. Yes. Theo leaves the lab after getting confirmation that she will be aboard this follow-up vessel, the Melusine. We should talk about the names of the vessels. <laughs> oh, yes. The Melusine and the Adder Goddess, they are both named after historical mermaids. Old tales of mermaids. Yes. And it actually is mentioned during her lecture, because it starts with Adder Goddess, as in the legend, and mm -hmm. ends with Adder Goddess, the ship. Shauna McGuire uses folklore and legends about the sea in conjunction with science fiction really well in this book. Yes, it works so well, and so much of it has these rhymes to it, where you'll see echoes of one thing in another thing, mm -hmm. and it is beautiful. We're introduced to Theo's boss, as well as the disability he's dealing with. He was injured and probably was never going to walk again. But through some semi-futuristic treatments, they were able to make him walk again. But he's in a lot of pain a lot of the time because of the treatment they did. And so he uses another treatment that I imagine helped to fund to help deal with this pain, which is part of why he feels indebted to Imagine. And he's not the only character. We will put a pin in that and come back to it. <laughs> we're putting a lot of pins in the pin board. Well, yes, because we're making a crazy conspiracy web, like all good monster hunters. One thing I want to put yet another pin in, which is we do get a brief scene of Theo in the car talking to his boss that you mentioned, and they introduce a very important tool to ratchet up the tension that we will be coming back to yes the shutter they, system yes they introduce that the melusine has a defensive shutter system to protect it from being overrun if it's attacked again and the shutters are malfunctioning don't worry they've only failed what was it three out of the five tests that they did yes which means they succeeded in two of course that's how the corporate overlords view that Next, we enter Zone 2. We're introduced to the ship, and they describe the ship through Olivia and her cameraman, Ray. They're our sort of point of view. They also help to give us another perspective of each of the characters we've met thus far. We get Olivia's views on Tori, Lewis, Dr. Toth, and Blackwell. Yes. Here we also see Ray, who is her cameraman, I believe this is when they mention that he also feels indebted to Imagine yes. because he used to be a professional MMA fighter. So he took an arrow to the knee. <laughs> and Imagine helped put him back together. And so he feels indebted and took a job with them. There is, and now that you've pointed it out, it jumps out to me. Another thing that I want to bring up here about mimicry, because... Something that's introduced here is that Olivia puts on a mask for the camera, which isn't really unusual for media personalities, but it does mirror the way that mimicry is used as a theme in other characters in the book. Yes, but it's used in a quite different way. With will, her, it's not danger. Yeah, we will get to why she is a mimic a little bit later. Next, we are introduced to the celebrity big game hunters. And this oh, is... Oh, boy. This is the other marriage we want to study under a microscope. Preferably after this one has been dissected. Absolutely. Jacques and Michi Abney. They are two of the most sadistic people you have ever met. They are introduced to having this scene where they torment one of the people loading the ship by telling them that there are live grenades in one of the crates that they're bringing aboard. And not telling them which one, because if you're careful, you don't need to know which one. <laughs> they are fascinating and horrific. They are horrible. We will be coming back to that. Dr. Toth notices that Theo is there and is very, very pissed about this because he did not tell her that he was going along on this expedition as well. Of course not. She would have locked him on their daughter's ship. But he's there as the company man and he refuses to listen to any other reason. 
I do actually want to rewind a little bit because we skipped over the first part where we start seeing a little bit of the slurability of this book, which is during this introduction sequence, there is a conversation between Olivia and her cameraman, Ray, where they're talking about some of the equipment that the scientists are bringing on board, talking about the brand being a Steranko, and Olivia mentions that she knows about this because of an ex-girlfriend, establishing that she is queer. Yes, and it's a very nicely done way of establishing that yeah. this character is queer. It's a very funny joke regardless because she's talking about how she memorized these scientific catalogs because her girlfriend used to use that as pillow talk. It's very funny. It is. So next we get the introduction of the ship by the captain. The captain introduces everyone to the ship, welcomes them aboard. We're introduced to the captain himself as well as a number of other characters. Tori's ex, Jason, is there on the ship. He is the worst. He is the worst, yes. We're introduced to Dr. Lennox, so not by name yet. We're introduced to Dr. Hallie Wilson, who's there as an ASL interpreter for her sisters, Dr. Holly Wilson and her twin sister, Heather Wilson, who is a submersible pilot. The two of them are deaf and their sister is there to provide sign language interpretation, as well as being a doctor herself. Hallie is there as the language specialist to try and communicate with the mermaids. Because we kind of glossed over this, but it's established in the Atagatis footage that they may have a signed language. So we are introduced to each of these characters. Dr. Tots sneaks away during the speech and notices two delivery trucks pulling away as the ship sails off and sort of puts this together that there's something that Imagine is trying to hide and then is pulled aside by Theo who shows her to this room. Do you want to talk about what's in this room? Secretly, three raised in captivity dolphins are hidden in the belly of the ship, which Theodore is planning to use potentially to contact or lure. We're not sure what the purpose of the dolphins is at this point, but they may be used as a sacrifice to the mermaids. I don't think that was ever the intention, but... It's clear from the word go that that is a possible fate. And it's clear that Dr. Toth is horrified by what he's become. As rightly she should be, especially as this book establishes in a little more of the near future science fiction-y nature of it, that humans have actually managed to establish true communications with dolphins at this point. And that kind of puts the idea that they are not sentient, not sapient, and deserve the same rights that a human has really into doubt. Theo sort of makes it clear that these dolphins have been offered the choice to be here because they're doing this to win their freedom, which great choice. Yeah. Kind of fucked up. Absolutely. Like, he makes a big deal that they have knowingly and with informed consent agreed to this. But the question of how informed that consent really can be in this situation keeps coming into play. Absolutely. Our next chapter continues a rising tension with the captain discussing the lackluster security of the vessel with his crew. They talk about how the security people who have been hired on were clearly hired to look good rather than any actual qualifications. Their qualification is they look good in a suit. <laughs> and then they talk about how the shutters have only been tested in dry dock and not actually really tested outside of that. And it really hammers home the point of corporations not really caring beyond the visual aspects of security. They don't care about actual security. They care about looking like they're secure. It's security theater. Like the TSA. Like the TSA, absolutely. We get another scene where we learn a little bit more about the twins through the perspective of their older sister, Hallie. Eventually she slinks off to have some peace and quiet because they're having this big argument. And I love hearing about them. They're- The way that their communication is described is really thoughtful. So Hallie ends up going and meeting Olivia. They have a little bit of conversation. 
this is the point where, bringing back to one of the pins I put earlier, we get an explanation for Olivia's masking and mimicry. She is neurodivergent and has severe social anxiety. She started putting on the mask to cope with that. And she started this gig of being this media personality as a form of therapy to put herself in front of people and in front of cameras. We should probably also mention what the twins were arguing about because it is important. Heather, the submersible pilot, wants to take her sub and dive all the way down to the bottom of the Challenger Deep while they're there and be the first person in a manned submersible to reach the bottom. Not only does she want to be the first person, she also wants to be the first person who is deaf to do this as like this big middle finger to systemic ableism that is mentioned a little bit later. And Holly is not so much a fan of this plan. No, she would rather her sister be safer and take things more safely. We do get this nice little description of the running lights from the Melusine at the end of the chapter, Twinkling Against the Sea, which is some lovely foreshadowing for stuff mm-hmm. we're going to see in the future. We also get a description of Tori, restless, unable to chase the specter of her sister away. And we get Shutter Failure Number One, which I'm going to read because the way that it's executed is perfect. The first active shutter drill began at midnight. It ended two minutes later in failure. The Melusine sailed on. The way she builds tension with the shutter test throughout this yeah. is yeah. chef's kiss. I love it. Our next chapter, we get some of the calm before the storm. People going about their business across the ship. And then we get Tori and Olivia speaking for the first time. Because Tori's been trying her best to avoid Olivia understandably because she's doing the same job that her sister did on the previous voyage olivia manages to convince tori to let her speak to her standing up for herself making it clear that i respect your pain but also i need to do my job and i don't respect your pain enough to let it come between me and my job which is healthy boundaries And we I love really that. like this scene because it's sort of a little encapsulation that sometimes what one person needs and what and what somebody else needs are in conflict and neither one of them is wrong. There's also this lovely description that I want to read out. But this was already a haunted house. Would giving Anne's ghost a face really have made it any better? I love some of the writing in this book. We also see Olivia describe a bit of why she took the job that we were talking about previously to Tori and the two sort of bond a little bit over that. It's made clear that Victoria also does things for anxiety. Her like coping mechanisms are different from Olivia's, but they sort of bond over this. And Tori invites Olivia to tour her lab. It's nice. It's a good scene. It establishes that there is a chance for them to overcome Anne's ghost between them. Yes, and they're getting closer. It's very interesting. The Melusine sails on. We get this interesting description from the point of view of a fish that escapes from a hook and swims down and ends up getting lured by something with glowing lights that lures it deeper and then grabs it with hands. And it's lovely tension building. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to if you didn't. (laughs) The way that perspective is used in this book is very, very clever. It jumps around a lot. It's told from probably like 12 different perspectives. Tori and Olivia's, but you get a little bit of almost every major player's perspective. And then at this point, there are two more shutter tests that fail, both of them at midnight, when no one will be able to notice. Mm -hmm. The ship weighs anchor over the Mariana's Trench. Tori and Lewis sign up to take out a rigid inflatable boat. Dr. Toth asks to accompany them. So they set out, and in in this really nice parallel, we also shift to Heather preparing to depart aboard her submersible, which 
This thing is tiny. Yeah. It's called the minnow. Uh-huh. If that gives you any clue as to how tiny it is. There is a comment somewhere in this section about how a previous iteration of her sub she literally could not eat for 24 hours if she wanted to fit through the hatch. Yes, it's tiny. So she prepares to set off on that and is still kind of arguing with her twin. The Both of them are arguing about this. Holly doesn't want to lose her. They're twins. She does not want her sister to put herself in danger. And one other thing I want to talk about briefly while we're talking about Heather's minnow is the way the book describes the accessibility alterations to the way the sub runs to accommodate that she is deaf. And they're generally described very positively. There's the implication that her sub and the way that her sub is designed to accommodate her deafness is actually an advantage, which yes. I really like. It says that it's an advantage because rather than having to speak and have someone speaking to her, which can be distracting while doing tight maneuvers, and said everything is visual. Alarms are lights that light up. There's messages that are text-based so they can be checked when you're through the complex maneuver. It's very nicely done. Another thing that I really love here is showing how different the twins are. Yeah. And it's nice seeing that in media because there's chunks of media that are like, oh, they're twins. They do everything twins together. Twins. They're a unit. They're basically one person, especially when you're talking about identical twins. And instead, they're talking about how many differences there are between the two of them. And you can see these differences throughout the entire book. And I love it. And there's still a lot of how they are a unit and closer than anyone else. But it has more to do with the fact that being deaf in a hearing society is very isolating. Yes, Heather begins her descent, diving down into the water. She is of the opinion that there are mermaids, that mermaids do exist, but she does not think that they will find them here. She thinks that they are migratory. Next, we get another scene of the trio aboard the RIB. Tori and Lewis describe their work to Dr. Toth in more detail. Dr. Toth is sort of amused by how much they're moving around and rushing around and how they remind her of her younger self. And she's glad she's not <laughs> that young anymore. Yeah. After the scene aboard the RIB, we get another scene describing Heather's descent. Toward the end of that scene, as she's descending, there is a lovely little bit of foreshadowing. A jellyfish drifted past, diaphanous tendrils dangling, and for the moment she could see the outline of a human form in the way its membranes pulsed, the ghost of a drowned girl forever doomed to haunt the restless sea. Foreshadowing and also like calling back to Anne. To Anne. It is another rhyme to that, and it's gorgeous. I love how she does this. So the three of them return to the ship, and they're met by Olivia. This is where I start caring about what's going on on the surface again, because Lewis is a meddling busybody. Lewis is a meddling busybody, and internally Tori is embarrassed to sort of realize that she is starting to get this little crush on Olivia, and it's very funny. And Lewis is just like, why don't you hang out together? I should go back to the lab. But the two of you should go and watch the submersible stuff together. Goodbye now. <laughs> he ships it. <laughs> so the two of them head down below deck to watch Heather's descent along with her sisters and a number of others. Heather continues her dive and we get some fantastic tension. Her console flashed. The answer was coming through. Heather, it said. Heather, please, it said. Heather, Please remain calm, it said. The messages are coming through choppy because of the distance for this, and it is beautiful tension building here. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was also going to mention that as a <laughs> section to read. She's told to come back to the surface, and she continues her descent. 
She kind of blows them off. She does not respond. She wants to know what's down there. So she doesn't respond so that she can blame it on, oh, there is a delay. And then she gets another message to come back now. She kind of blows it off again. Yeah. She's like too deep for sort of descent, finishing mapping pass, surfacing on schedule. And this is when the mermaids show up. One of them comes up to her and they describe how they look looking like the face of a viper fish mixed with a mummified ape they're creepy little buggers they're creepy but also like there's certain beauty in them as well then the problems start the mermaid attacks the ship and as the mermaid attacks she's surrounded by other mermaids so she tries to start surfacing Inevitably, for this kind of thing, we get our first death with one of the larger mermaids slamming into the submersible and causing a whole rupture. It's very sad. It's quite unsettling, too. When the final impact came, when the water flooded into the pod and took the rest of the world away, she didn't fight it. It would go faster if she didn't fight it. It could never have gone fast enough. It's brutal. Yeah, this book does a really good job of saying more with less when it comes to the violence. Yes. There is plenty of gore in this, but also there are moments like this. Even the more explicit scenes, the true horror of them is often in what is left to the imagination. And we'll get to that in a little bit. We get Holly's reaction to her twin's death. And it is heart-wrenching seeing how different people respond to grief. Holly shuts her remaining sister out for a while. Not because she doesn't want the company, but just because she's not Heather. They were part of a trio, and yet there was still that inherent that the twins were always closer. And Heather shuts Holly out because... She's not good enough to fill the hole, and it's tragic. In this scene, we also get the acknowledgement that there are times when, even when there is this grief, there's also a mission that other people have to do. Tori realizes, with Olivia prompting her, that this means that the mermaids are directly Mm -hmm. below them, and so this is the perfect time for her to get the readings that she needs. I really like that Olivia is the one to redirect Tori toward the sonar because it shows it shows that they've gotten closer but it also kind of shows that they both operate on a similar wavelength which builds into my theory that Tori is undiagnosed ADHD in contrast to Olivia being diagnosed autistic. We get this little scene of the Avneys being horrible little freaks uh, (laughs) where they're preparing in their cabin for what's to come and just being horny for violence. Yeah, they fuck nasty on a pile of grenades. Our next scene, we get a little bit of grieving from Dr. Toth where she blames herself for what has happened with Heather. And that's kind of something we really haven't gotten into about Toth as a character. Her major motivation for everything, for being on this journey, is guilt. Because she's the one who told Imagine where to look to find the sirens that resulted in the entire crew of the Atagatis mission being killed. And she had the opportunity to go on that mission and declined it because she knew that it would be dangerous. And she declined it for her own safety, but didn't stop them. And we're going to put a pin in that and come back to it when we get into some more dissection of the marriage. We're moving on to the next zone. I would actually like to call out specifically the two short quotes that open this zone because the quotes given are from heather and holly and they really contrast the way that they look at this mission because heather says there are some challenges that are worth risking everything and holly says nothing is worth the risk of being lost at sea that is very beautiful and haunting Mm -hmm. 
So the next chapter starts with the perspective of the mermaids, their perspective of this incident that has just happened. And this is the first time that we get a point of view section from the mermaids, which is really interesting because the kind of media that this book is heavily leaning on, you usually don't get the monster's perspective. It's just so interesting to get this glimpse into it and how they viewed what happened and their motivation for it, which is instinct. It's just mm -hmm. hunting. It's this thing came into our territory. We've encountered things like this before, before we let them go because we had plenty of food. But now with the seas changing because of climate change, the food is running out, so we need to take whatever food we can get. And this is not the only time we get their perspective. But it is the first one. News of her death spreads throughout the ship. We see grief from various people. We also see Jacques try to recruit Hallie to help him get a head count of how many mermaids there are. They want more than anything to bag a mermaid for their yeah, kills. That's all they care about. That's what they're here for. We also get to dig a little more into Hallie's relationship with her sisters. Because this is where they reveal that their parents were the ones who essentially pushed her into the role of translator and really kind of dialed up the older sibling being the protector for the younger ones to the extreme. Absolutely. Hallie just has eldest daughter syndrome of the nth degree yeah of course their parents are kind of like that yeah they named their children heather hallie and holly <laughs> who does that we also get a description of jacques from hallie's point of view which is terrifying his eyes were cold glaciers set into a human skull and left to play the part of windows to a dark and terrifying soul Hallie hesitated, revising her first impression. Maybe the point of the theatrics was to distract from those eyes, which had more in common with what little she'd seen of the mermaids before they attacked than they did with anything human. Again, the yeah. mimicry. Another mm -hmm. bit of that mimicry theme. Jacques invites her to help him. He sees it as logical. You're going to want revenge, so you're going to help me, clearly. And she refuses, because that is not how she wants her revenge. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that the conflict here is not that she doesn't want revenge, that she's not taking the moral high ground. It's just that this is not the way she wants to achieve it. No, and, and we see how she wants to achieve it. She is then approached by Dr. Lennox, who asks for her help with learning to communicate with the mermaids. And she agrees to this because she wants to be able to speak with the mermaids and to tell them it's their fault that her sister died. To know that this is revenge, which is in some ways kind of shittier. Tori and Lewis learn more about their language. They figure out that they have sort of this hybrid language where part of their language is silent for when they are close while hunting and spoken language as well, including what they steal from others. They make the connection that they have a language and more than one, quite possibly. Mm -hmm. They have to be sentient creatures. Yeah, really starts to bring the morality of everything that's going on into question. And we get shutter test number four, yet another failure. Yet another failure, and this one is performed in the middle of the day. They're running out of time. They know they're running out of time, so they perform this during the middle of the day when anyone can see it. Beautiful tension building. The next chapter starts with Michi asking Jacques how he fucked up getting this scientist to help them. Blaming him for, you must have said something. Clearly she wants to have revenge, so she should have been here before you even. You must have said something. This kind of establishes that Michi is the more socially aware and arguably the more dangerous of the two of them. Oh, absolutely. And then they fuck nasty on a pile of weapons again. Yeah. Our next 
big scene is more to do with the dolphins and it really calls into question like the morality of what they are doing with these dolphins and the captivity of dolphins mm -hmm. in general. Like, they really make it unquestionable in this section that the dolphins are people. They yeah. are smart. The cytologist, Dr. Lennox, has been playing chess with them. Yes, and he has opinions about which ones are better at chess yeah. than the others. There's also just Theo continuing to insist that, hey, I got their permission for this. They agreed to come along with this. They had as much opportunity to refuse as the rest of us when- The bargain they were given wasn't fair. Yes. They may have given informed consent, but it was informed consent under duress. There's also some interesting discussion about how the mermaids would possibly be classified under science mm -hmm. and how the scientific system and labeling things can be so difficult. Really nerdy shit, yeah. but it's something that I find so fascinating. The granular level of research put into the biology of the mermaids in this book is fascinating. So it is around here that Blackwell's plan for the dolphins is revealed. He wants them to learn to speak with the mermaids because they have vocal range that's similar to that of the mermaids. And so he has brought them along to learn to speak with them, which sure is a choice for a creature that has just cracked open a submarine to send yeah. these dolphins out. That's immediately brought up by Dr. Toth. She immediately calls it to question, hey, you know they're just going to get immediately killed, right? He just refuses to see it. It really kind of illustrates just how far he's come, particularly in light of there's a specific line near the end of the book that we're going to come back to this about. Dr. Toth and Dr. Lennox get acquainted a little bit here. There's this description I want to read just because <laughs> of lesbianism. She had held a harpoon in her hand and screamed expletives at a whaling crew, salt in her hair and blood in her eyes while he was arguing about his thesis. Hot. Hot. Bonk. I'm surprised you didn't go for the one where he describes her as a cross between the devil and Helen of Troy. Listen, there's a lot of good descriptions of her. <laughs> I can't choose. And we get a little perspective that the mermaids are forming hunting parties that are slowly rising up towards the Melusine. We see some hints of this through Daryl and Gregory, who are two of the engineers who are trying to find the fault in the shutter system and get spooked by lights in the water. Eventually, they decide to go and tell the captain about this. They're just some guys, and I love that for them. But by the time they get back, the lights are gone, and the captain seems relieved and just sort of dismissive about it. And then the screaming begins. And then the screaming begins. And it does not stop. We're about halfway through, and this is the point where this really comes into its own as a monster slasher grindhouse thing. So we see Olivia and Ray filming a sunset shot and also talking a bit about Olivia's developing crush on Tori. <laughs> and then we also get a little bit of of story about her past and some of the stuff she's had to deal with. This is where the content warning for parental abuse comes in. I mean, arguably there's a little bit of that with the Wilson's parents, but it's much more textual here. And the thing that I think is really interesting about this is this is the point where it's established on the page that Olivia is autistic and she, also that she is a lesbian. She exclusively is into girls, and her parents were kind of homophobic, which is where the content warning comes in. Actually, her mother isn't exactly homophobic, but she also sees her daughter as, oh, you're too sweet and pure for anything having to do with sex. Yeah, it really gets into the infantilization of people with learning disabilities and mental illness. And also discusses how that harm can last longer than the harm of actual physical abuse. 
As they're discussing these things, Olivia notices that there is somebody hanging off the side of the ship and Ray offers a hook to them to pull them aboard. This is, of course, a mistake. This is not a person, it's a mermaid. And it takes the hook and quickly climbs up and takes Ray as Mm -hmm. well and takes him overboard. Ray saves Olivia here by pushing her away so that the mermaid can't grab her as well. Because he is best boy, sweetest guy. He did not deserve this. He really did not deserve this. He goes overboard and Olivia is still screaming when the captain gets to her and they go through what happened. This is the first example of... Like, the mermaid's attacking that's really, truly violent on the page. And it's interesting because very little of the actual gore is described, but it's still very visceral and you can just see it. I also want to mention how much I love how she ends a lot of her chapters with Mm. these short, snappy sentences. Like, this one ends with, It took him, she said again. No one else said anything. And I love these short, snappy little endings to the chapters like this. And she does that a lot. And I really love every time she does that. It's a very good way of setting the hook between chapters. Tori and Lewis are slowly figuring out the mimicry angle of their language. And they realize that the mermaids use this mimicry while hunting so that the prey doesn't know that they are coming. As they realize this, they have this moment of shocked realization of, oh, it's the language I use while they're hunting. They're hunting. What are they hunting? Us. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love how this is done, the suspense that that builds, and just that moment of realization. Olivia arrives as they're heading out to go speak with Mr. Blackwell because this poor girl needs a hug. She really does. She just watched... The person who was her shield get killed. Probably her best friend from what we see of their relationship. They're very close friends. Tori comforts her as well as Lewis also comforts her in this very insightful way. Lewis gives her a handheld camera so that she can hold the camera. For someone who's as much of a himbo dipshit as Lewis is, he's incredibly insightful when it comes to social interactions. They head down to go and find Blackwell and they end up butting into this secret lab and getting invited in by Mr. Blackwell after they talk about, hey, the mermaids are here. And so they explain about the different languages to Mr. Blackwell and he really just blows this off and he commands that Dr. Lennox release the dolphin. And this surprises Dr. Lennox and alarms him. <laughs> yeah, understandably. He, d- he does care about the dolphins. And it's very clear that Blackwell doesn't. Mm-hmm. And there's one thing I want to get into a little bit here. It's a little further back in the scene where they're discussing the possibility of an all-out assault after they reveal to the rest of the people in the lab that Ray has been taken from the deck. And there's an interesting exchange between Hallie and Dr. Toth, where we kind of see the mermaids held up as a mirror for humanity. This is the surface, objected Hallie. They should know that their domain stops where the water does. Really? No one told your sister that ours ended where the water began. I do love a lot of what they say back and forth. Specifically, I wanted to call out because I think it gets into one of the underlying themes that we are not really any different from the mermaids. We're just on the other side of the water. So they release the dolphins to quite likely die. Blackwell seems to not care in the slightest, which is such a far departure from where he started when Mm -hmm. he and Dr. Toth got married because they were originally both Greenpeace warriors. And here he is sending these dolphins to their death. This chapter says, you're sending them to die for their freedom. Seems harsh. Humans have done exactly that for centuries, said Blackwell. If they wanted to be treated as our equals, this is part of the bargain. 
it really completes this arc of this is not the man he used to be. This mm -hmm. is someone wearing his skin. We move on to the next zone. I do want to talk a little bit about the slightly longer quote that opens this zone, which is a confidential memo from James Golden, the CEO of Imagine, to Theo that really hammers home the, the true villain here. The thing that makes victims of every single other person in this book is corporate greed, and Golden is the face of corporate greed because this memo describes that the only thing he really cares about in this voyage is restoring his company's reputation and refilling the bank accounts. The chapter starts off with this devastating scene where we follow the dolphins on their mission. And we mostly get the perspective of two of them. The eldest, Kearney, and X. I mean, Twitter. I mean, <laughs> X. Twitter? Stop it. She don't deserve this. She, she doesn't. But we follow them, and they are all killed by mermaids. I really like that this is included from their perspective and not from the perspective of someone back in the ship watching on a video feed or watching the trackers because it presents a really interesting contrast with the sections that are following the perspective of the mermaids. Yes, it's very interesting and just oh so sad watching them all die. And the oldest one of them really embraces his death because he'd rather die here than in captivity. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, cool, this is fucked. Yeah. So we go back to the ship and to everyone's reactions to the deaths of the dolphins and discussing how absolutely fucked it was that they sent them out. And Theo, for the most part, just does not seem to care. And then we get to the interesting part and the thing that Theo's kind of been keeping from everybody else, which is what he's really here to achieve. One of the mermaids decides to be curious and poke its head in through the hole that the dolphins had gone through. Comes through into their tank, trying to see what is going on here. Theo orders that they close the tank, and it's clear that he means to capture a mermaid. This has been a plan from the beginning, because mm -hmm. the door to this enclosure slams down with enough force to have seriously injured or killed something. And so we get to see the mermaid in its own environment, see it described in water as opposed to on the surface. Then and, they are still creepy. But there's also beauty to them, and people see the beauty to them, even if it is horrible. There's this really good quote. It was beautiful in its own terrible way. So many monsters are. And that echoes heavily with descriptions of Blackwell, who has been described as... End of Jacques and Michi. End of Jacques and Michi, all of whom have been described as very, very attractive. It's lovely. There is some mimicry back and forth with the mermaid. It's all mimicry here and not communication where they're speaking and the mermaid can hear them and it echoes back different words, mostly fixating on words that had the most stress on them, which Dr. Toth reasons is likely them fixing on words most likely to be a call for help or an invitation. Dr. Toth confronts Theo on this being his plan all along, and it's hard to tell whether that's actually the truth or not. I think he likes to think he's better than that. I think this is a lie he's telling himself as much as his wife. And then at the very end of the chapter, Hallie approaches the tank and begins to sign to the mermaid. And the mermaid stops trying to struggle against the tank and starts signing back to her. And there's this beautiful moment of the two of them signing to each other back and forth. The grieving sister signing to the mermaid. This is beautiful, and also, if you have read Rolling in the Deep, incredibly creepy. I'm trying not to bring that book into this too much, but this is worth mentioning. 
because there is a brief sequence near the end of that book about the loss of the Atagaris, where another deaf character in that crew attempts to sign to communicate with the mermaids that are attacking. And this is told from the mermaid's perspective, and they kind of make fun of him because he basically is miming back that he is prey. And then they eat his face. <laughs> I love how you put that so delicately. <laughs> then they eat his face. The trio of Lewis, Tori, and Olivia are kicked out of this secret lab. Lewis decides to return to his own lab, leaving Tori and Olivia behind. Olivia really does not want to be alone here, and this is when the gay enters the chat. Yeah, this is where they both kind of admit that they're into each other. It's very cutely done. They're so bad at flirting. But the two of them eventually manage to work their way around to, oh, we each like each other, and they end up kissing, and it is adorable. And then we get to Lewis making all the most smart decisions. There's just something really interesting about this section with Lewis because we get a little bit of his introspection about his work. And he is very weirdly self-aware for the kind of person that he is. Because he fully acknowledges that he's probably never going to achieve anything with his work. He's chasing dreams and rainbows and impossible shit, and the real value in what he does is by doing that and throwing money around, he's creating opportunities for people like Tori to do real work with value. And it's interesting to see a character who fits that archetype, who's fully aware of that archetype, it also hasn't super aged well because this is very parallel to people like the elongated muskrat. <laughs> so he realizes that one of the mermaids is coming up to the ship. He sees it aren't a camera. And in all of his wisdom, he decides that he is going to go and take photos of this mermaid up and close. He reasons, oh, it's a sea creature. It will be slow on land. Dipshit. This is such dumbassery, and I... It's hot. Bonk. Listen. I'm gonna get a spray bottle. <laughs> so he goes off to take these photos, and this mermaid moves so much faster than he expected. Despite this not being super uncommon. Look at alligators. Mm -hmm. They are so fast on land. So he almost gets killed by this mermaid and is only saved at the last minute by the intervention of the Abneys, who shoot this mermaid to death. And then this chapter ends with Lewis realizing that the mermaid has been killed and just getting very, very excited in this moment because, oh, we have a dead mermaid. We can study this. And that's scientists for you. <laughs> So in this next chapter, we're back to the secret lab and Dio admits to Dr. Toth that, hey, the shutters are not actually ready to be deployed, that they failed every single systems test. I do want to call out the discussion here between Hallie and Dr. Lennox, where they talk about language and the barriers of trying to communicate with another species. And Lennox kind of gets his ass read to him for not knowing that there are multiple forms of sign language, which loops back to the very beginning of the book with the author's note about signing exact English. She snaps at him and the mermaid ends up repeating her words because they were said in a snappy way. And she apologizes and Dr. Toth waves it away saying, Knowledge that can be imparted loudly and with passion always lasts longer than knowledge that has to be whispered. You care. That's a good thing. It's a great quote. Eventually news comes to them about the mermaid, and Dr. Toth is pretty much at the door before they <laughs> finish saying that they have a dead one going off to supervise the necropsy. Then we get to the gay more of the gay. Yep. We flip back to Tori and Olivia, who are in the process of getting it on. <laughs> the two of them have gotten quite close quite quickly, mm -hmm. and it's adorable. I love these two. Yeah. They are nervous around each other, but both of them clearly care a lot. 
It's very sweet. The thing that's most interesting to me in this section has very little to do with the boning that is currently going on. Because this is the first time we get a really detailed glimpse of Tori's relationship with her ex. And we're gonna talk about that a lot in a second here. But there's mention that he was kind of a selfish lover. He didn't get her off and didn't really care about her pleasure at all as long as he got his. This scene is sort of interrupted towards the end by a phone call from Lewis about the mermaid that has been killed and the necropsy that's about to be performed, telling them to hurry up and show up. So they quickly dress and head off. Dr. Toth chooses Tori as an assistant for this procedure. There's this scene where Blackwell tells Olivia that she has to be in front of the camera again despite the fact that she's still like grieving heavily like she's still deeply grieving and this whole scene of him pretty much forcing her to get in front of the camera again it's kind of an asshole move and it kind of isn't because one of the things that has been kind of bubbling in the background since ray's death is the contrast between the way that tori grieves and the way that olivia grieves tori is as we've seen over and over again obsessive. She is obsessed with her sister's death, with the cause of it, finding it. That is how she makes peace with it. Olivia dissociates. She steps back from the world, and being in front of the camera is part of how she does that. But it's the fact that he forces her to. Mm. That's the real dick move here. Yeah. Like I said, it's not entirely kind. No. But it's also not entirely cruel. We see in the next chapter some more of Daryl and Gregory being nervous about the water. Mostly Daryl being nervous about the water. Then we get a little bit of perspective from the mermaids of them arguing back and forth about whether to begin the hunt immediately or wait longer. This argument continues to go on as the necropsy begins. The whole thing is recorded with Olivia in front of the camera, but most of the talking is done by Dr. Toth, who is really good in front of a camera, and Dr. Lennox as well. And the two of them sort of get into a scientific dick measuring contest. (laughs) There's points where Dr. Lennox sort of interrupts, but not entirely. They just kind of go back and forth having this dick measuring contest. There's another part later on where they're deciding what these things might be. And Dr. Lennox is like, they're not amphibians. Or if they are. And Dr. Toth interrupts with, and they are. (laughs) And she's just very confused. And she later goes on to describe how they are most likely amphibians. And how they're somewhat similar to how the Ashtalot developed. They developed in a sort of similar way where they kept attributes of its juvenile form. It is very interesting, very nerdy science talk. (laughs) I I love how the science is put into the science fiction here. Dr. Toth also reveals that, hey, we should not be calling these things mermaids because this one here is male. She says that they should be more properly termed as sirens. So we begin our next zone, and we see Jason, who is the worst, carrying a bowl. There's one thing that comes just a little bit before we're going to talk a whole lot about Jason. Just before that, we get a brief scene of Dr. Toth finishing up the necropsy. And this is the first point where we introduce the idea that there is something about the biology of the sirens that's very important that everybody is overlooking. Yes. And we will be coming back to that. She notes that there's something that they are missing, that she specifically is missing, that she shouldn't be missing. But then we get to the scene with Jason, where he is carrying this bowl full of water and some of the symbiotes that live in the siren's hair. And he's carrying them back to the lab he shares with his overseer. Who's also the worst, and they fucking deserve each other. They are both 
awful people and they both deserve each other. We get to see a lot of how Jason views his relationship with Tori, how he is definitely not over her and is trying to get back at her for dumping him. He has this incredibly selfish, toxic masculinity view of the world. Specifically, there's a passage here. He could be holding the goddamn golden ticket, and Dr. Toth had just handed it to him. Like it didn't matter as much as her dead monster. He could raise his own sirens from larval form, raise them to respect him as their parent and keeper, and she'd be the one standing on the sidelines then, wouldn't she? Let Dr. Toth come to him, hat in hand, and his moon-eyed ex-girlfriend at her side, begging for scraps of his research. And would he grant her requests? Would he be magnanimous? God! He He is... doesn't even give Victoria the grace of being named. And his research is more or less being stolen from him by his overseer, who is- He kind of deserves that. An ass. And he was warned of this by Victoria and ignored her because he knows what's right. He's the only one who knows what's right. God, there's this moment where he's talking about how he has worked so hard to get here and Victoria got here by luck and didn't deserve this but was here because she was lucky. Never mind the fact that he literally overstated their yeah. relationship to try and get aboard this ship. And her research area is more directly relevant to what they're doing. Absolutely. His overseer tells him to leave the symbiotes behind and that he will be the one to deal with them, not Jason. And then we get a direct encounter between Jason and Tori. Yes, in which he just makes a complete ass of himself. He is on his way back to the lab to get more samples of the dead ones so he can just dissect them, realizing that they will be there and he might be able to get an edge over his overseer. And he picks up as they're talking that Tori and Olivia have developed some flavor of relationship and he's a total biphobic dick about it. Absolutely. And even as he's being just the absolute worst, he's also praising himself about how good he was in their relationship. <laughs> Talking about how he was a keeper because of allowing her to keep a photo of one of her friends that she had previously been in a relationship on her board. There's a line in there as well where he kind of implies that Lewis is her keeper. He's just the worst. Because clearly she can't have an opinion about when it's time to bone down as a woman. He's the worst, and I have met guys just like him. So before anyone says, absolutely. oh, this is absolutely too much, blah, blah, blah. No, this is truth. And he finally makes it to the wet lab to get whatever he might be able to get from the siren's hair. And Dr. Toth gives him some advice on, hey, your overseer is absolutely using you. And he blows her off. Of course he does. So he does manage to find some specimens and takes them with him, muttering all the while about how people are going to remember him. And there's a really interesting part right here at the end of this section where he kind of almost gets it. Because we learn that he's a very detail-oriented kind of guy, and we get a little bit of background about him and his father who pushed him to be a man's man, and all he wanted to do was do fucking needlepoint with his grandmother. And he does do needlepoint, and he's good at it, and he's ashamed of it. It's like, dude, you were so close to getting it. So the next chapter starts with Dio continuing to not be able to see just how much he's changed from who he once was. Despite Dr. Toth telling him explicitly. Let me just read this quote. I don't know, you and me and some beautiful thing swimming around its tank, flipping its fins for us to admire. Seems exactly like old times. Jillian gave him a sidelong look. From what I remember, in old times we would have been the ones standing in front of this tank with hammers in our hands, 
getting ready to set the captive free. And his response is, some things have to change for the rest to stay the same. That so perfectly encapsulates exactly why their marriage has fallen so heavily apart. We get a scene of Holly and Hallie meeting up again, sharing some of their grief with one another. Just seeing Holly's grief and the description of her grief, it's so well done. I'm going to read another quote just immediately. <laughs> she was my sister. She was the world. Of course she died for nothing. There's no other way she could have died. If she had been dying for something, the world would have realized it was a stupid thing and given her back. And I, I just love that. I love how different forms of grief are shown in this book. Then we get our next scene with Jason. We come back to the fuckboy. Dissecting his specimens in his lab, preparing them for dissection. And he doesn't have any of his tools besides like the most rudimentary ones. And he's even an ass about that because he's talking about how he's doing it the traditional way and how it's just going to be more zeros on the paycheck he's given. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Then he slips in his room, falls on one of the specimens and pricks his hand. This is a fatal mistake. This is where the book gets really fucking gross. Yet, a severe content warning for this. His death is gruesome. He melts from the inside out, just kind of leaking and gross, and he's dead before he knows it. And we move on to the next thing where they're slowly figuring out more of the language Tori Lewis and Olivia together figuring out that their stolen language is quite likely used in metaphor. They directly reference Star Trek here. Specifically the one episode from Next Gen that's a meme. They reference that episode of Star Trek The Next Generation and that is how they sort of figure it out. And it's something where they know that they can't exactly decode this they can make logical connections, but they'll never be able to truly decode this part of their language. Then one of the security goons shows up asking for Tori in regards to Jason's death. It's quickly determined that no, she was not the cause of this, of course. She even feels bad that this happened to him. She says that he was an ass, but she feels he didn't deserve this because he was once her friend. And we see more of Dr. Lyons being an ass, not really caring about the loss of the person, but the loss of the assistant to do stuff for him. <laughs> and then he decides that no, he's not actually that sorry because now he gets to steal all the dead guy's research. It's not stealing. I'm just making sure it doesn't go to waste is what uh -huh. he thinks. And then we get a few pages further where the yacht scene comes back into play because they mention, again, that there are a lot of recorded disappearances here that are likely mermaid attacks and specifically reference party yachts. It still feels like a thing where they could have just mentioned this in here and it would be fine without the first part. It adds depth. I disagree. You're wrong, <laughs> but okay. So night fills the sky with stars glittering off the sea again, talking about lights in the ocean, which has been this thing that pops up over and over again, similar to mimicry. And then the trio come to the realization that the mermaids have stopped talking and that the reason why they've stopped talking is because the hunt has truly begun. Mm -hmm. They compare it to cats and how cats chitter when they see birds and then stop once they actually start to hunt. And it's another fantastically written scene. And then we get another scene from the mermaid's perspective as they pull themselves up and onto the ship before the perspective shifts to that of Jacques as he wanders around the lower deck with the security team preparing for whatever is to come. 
he realizes that there are some mermaids behind him and his team turns in time to kill them. And this is where, like, the slaughter really, really begins in this book. This is where the killing starts, and it doesn't really stop until the end of the book. Yes. As these deaths are happening, there's another moment of the shutter system failing again. Jacques' security team leaves him because he's kind of prickly. And honestly, because they're scared. But also, they're just the worst security and he and Michi speak, making pretty much a game out of this. Yeah. Then we get a scene of Tori arguing that they can't remain in their lab because the doors aren't sturdy enough and they don't have any food. And this has kind of been established to be true at various points that the doors are not strong enough to protect them, really. And so they slowly come to the decision that they are going to try and make a break for the cafeteria where they can at least bar themselves in and have enough food. And then we get a scene with Michi and the guards who are patrolling with her. She is so good at manipulating people and making them feel like they want to follow her. And the other thing worth noting here is that at the end of this scene, Michi is wounded by a ricocheted bullet during a conflict with some of the sirens. The bullet passes through one of the sirens and she collapses fairly immediately. Which, you know, is not good. No. Standard reaction to getting shot, but... (laughs) Then we have a scene with Hallie trying to communicate with the siren again. And amusing back and forth between her and Dr. Lennox, where there's a little bit more dick measuring, but in a very funny way. I mean, they literally call it out as, yeah. are we done playing who has the bigger dick? Eventually, she starts speaking to it. They successfully establish communication. Besides that, she also says that she has found the beauty in the sirens, and that the beauty is in their hands. This is the sequel hook. There is intended to be a sequel for this book that has not yet been greenlit by the publisher, and this is kind of where they establish that. Michi is transported to the medical bay. Something is deeply, deeply wrong. They contact Dr. Toth because she's the best chance at figuring out what this is. As well as they contact Jacques, who flips out when he gets there and sees her like this, and... Threatens a bunch of people and then goes off to shoot the sirens. This is probably the most graphically horrific death in the entire book. Largely because what kills her is very similar to what killed Jason. But she does not get the mercy of dying quickly. Dr. Toth arrives helping to oversee this, trying to save her, but... In the next chapter, the trio make their way onto the deck and realize that Holly has not been warned about the sirens being on the hunt. So they go talk to her and try to warn her about it. And there's some fun stuff here about their assumptions based on her being deaf and breaking those assumptions with Holly's reactions because Holly's able to read their lips when they're speaking slowly. And like, she can talk. People tend to assume that people who are born deaf never learn to talk. Not only that, there's this fantastic scene where... I didn't know you could talk, said Tori. Of course I can talk, said Holly. But you can't understand me, so I had to learn to make sounds with my mouth. And this also sort of ties back to a scene that we kind of glossed over with some casual ableism from Holly's lab mates, who never even tried that much to communicate with her. They have a couple of close calls with the sirens as they're making their way across the deck and they eventually get into an elevator, have another close call with the siren and eventually make it to the stairwell where they have another close call with the siren and this one manages to injure Lewis. It is too good and does not deserve it. The next chapter begins with Michi's death, and it's gruesome. 
Dr. Toth is upset about it because she did not sign up for helping with this sort of stuff. She's EMT certified, but she did not want to be a part of this because it's no. upsetting. And so she decides that she's going to return to her lab and take some samples of the toxins with her to try and figure out what she can about the toxin. They end up meeting up with the trio and Holly. They run into each other and I, I love the moments between Dr. Toth and Holly because Dr. Toth understands some sign yeah. and is able to sign to Holly. <laughs> and Holly immediately is like, I'm going with you. You're my new best friend. <laughs> you know how to talk with me. These assholes don't. I'm going with you. They get back to Dr. Toth's lab and Theo is there. We kind of get another scene of Theo being a huge dick. And is apparently not on his medication. And so he's deeply in pain, which goes some way to explain his asshole behavior here. Yeah. But he is an ass here. And then he gets the good weed. His wife feeds him chocolate that's laced with weed. And lies about it being low THC. She lies about how potent that shit is. <laughs> Which is <laughs> their relationship. They're fascinating. There's also just this line that Theo says of, My superior said get a mermaid, and I've done my best to oblige. It's going to be a bit awkward if I don't survive the retrieval, but I suppose that's going to be someone else's problem. Dude! Uh. Do you hear yourself? He frustrates me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Holly helps Dr. Toth prepare the toxins for study. And this is where it's revealed that Jillian speaks a good deal of sign in scientific areas because she decided that if she was going to focus on any area, she was going to focus on that. And I love that as a small detail. Dr. Toth cleans out Lewis's wound and Olivia comes up with a plan to reach the top deck. Kind of before that becomes relevant, it's established that the lower decks have lost communication with the control room and the captain up at the top deck. And Olivia comes up with this plan to reach the top deck through maintenance chutes. And I kind of love this because in the kind of slasher horror monster movies that this book is really a love letter to, Olivia would be the fainting, frail heroine who just constantly needs saving by the lead protagonist and she's really the one who saves them all with this plan yes i mean this plan my mental image of this just reminds me of ripley crawling through air ducts and alien yeah and that's where my brain goes for this the next chapter begins with the swimming pool outside of the secret lab being full of sirens who had gotten through via the pump system that the pool had and couldn't get out again. Like a lot of the fish that were in the pool earlier. And one of them accidentally finds the latch to get the door open. Dr. Lennox and Hallie are inside and are in fairly grave danger as this group of mermaids comes towards them. And then their captive siren saves them, signs to the others, and tells them to back off. And they do. And this siren that they are holding captive saves them. The publisher needs fucking green light the <laughs> sequel, because I need to know where that's going. <laughs> I would love to see this sequel. Olivia fully details her plan, and Tori insists on accompanying her to the shoot. The two of them make their way there. There's a conversation right before they part ways that is really interesting, where they kind of talk about love and the nature of love in these sort of high-tension scenarios and establish quite firmly that they are not in love yet, but they both want the chance to be. And I think that's really an interesting deconstruction of the way this kind of story usually goes. Falling in love with the person who saves you. Olivia goes into this shoot heading up and Tori comes face to face with a siren. And while attempting to run from the siren, ends up going overboard. And that ends that section. Mm -hmm. Which, holy hell, that's a cliffhanger. Yeah. So our next section begins with her hitting the water 
and trying her best to blend in and not draw attention to herself because she's just surrounded in the water by sirens. They don't notice her because of the same reason why people don't notice some change in their environment, just going past it. She's not supposed to be there, therefore they don't notice her. There's this short scene where Dr. Lennox is in shock about what happened there and Hallie thanks the siren that saved her and the siren responds with one of the signs that it had learned for your welcome. Once again, publisher, give me the sequel. Next, we get Olivia making her way up through this maintenance tunnel. And it sucks. It's very claustrophobic. Would not want to be in there. She's psyching herself up. And as she reaches the exit of it, there's this moment of her psyching herself up by introducing it like one of her segments. Yeah, it ties back into the idea of Olivia and the way that she masks being a form of mimicry because she's absolutely masking here and she's mimicking the person that she wants to be. She comes out on the top deck and gets a flashlight shined in her face. The next chapter begins with some really gross shit. Some really, really gross shit involving Michi's death and what happens to her body afterwards as it melts. And it's horrible. If you have a thing against gore, do not read this. And this is not gory, but there's a really interesting passage here from the perspective of the ship's doctor about her death. When a person died, you covered their face. You told them they would be missed. You closed their eyes if necessary. You lied to them. Because nobody liked Michi, but it still feels right to show her that respect in death. The other doctor asks if they should call for Jacques, and everyone's just like, no, that's probably not a good idea. He's liable to go off the deep end. And when he arrives, that is exactly what he does. He threatens a lot of them <laughs> and basically says that he would shoot them, but he doesn't want to waste the bullets. His grieving is terrifying. There is a brief moment before he settles into anger that I find personally really powerful because we get to see this glimpse of him as a broken man and that he really isn't anything without her. Ah, said Jax. He walked forward, stopping just shy of the cot, hands fluttering in front of him like wounded birds. Ah, he said again, and it was a sound of protest, not of understanding. It was the sort of sound a man who just received a grievous wound might make. Too small and soft to be anything but fatal. Also, the ship's doctor is ballsy as fuck because when she apologizes to him and he's like, you're sorry? Did you fail her? Did you fail her? Her response is, every death under my care is on me. That is what it means to be a doctor. She's a really minor character, but I like her a lot. Jacques demands to know whose bullet killed her, and one of the guards blames one of the ones who had just died, which... <laughs> I don't blame him. I don't know if that's true or not, but I don't blame him. Probably not, but, like, just, oh, it was this guy who you just said died. <laughs> and so he stalks off to go kill more mermaids. Olivia arrives at the top and speaks to Gregory and Daryl, who tell her that the captain is gone, that he got taken. They managed to finish the repairs. They finally found the fault. And by the time they got back, he was dead and everyone with him. And the code died with him. And then we get back to Lewis, Theo, and Dr. Toth. And there's just one line here that's fascinating where they're talking about dr toth being kind of a bitch and not actually caring about all the sirens that are being killed and theo says people always did think of you as the conservationist in the family which is fascinating because that implies a that she was not which kind of indirectly implies that he was, and really illustrates how much further he has fallen than we thought. 
So Olivia enters the control room and realizes just how gross it is. It's a slaughterhouse, but she manages to activate the distress beacon and then calls Blackwell and asks for his code. And the code, there's this minor detail about the code being excessively long and how it's clearly some coder back on shore thought it was a great idea even though it's supposed to be for an emergency because no one will misuse it if it's super long she manages to type it in and she learns that victoria is missing and presumed dead so she starts grieving for her and what could have been she seals the ship because it's what Victoria would have died for. The shutters close and the mermaids that are climbing slowly fall off and the ones who aren't are trapped aboard the ship. Tori sees that the shutters are closed and so no one will notice her in the water. So she decides that her only chance is to try and swim for the pool's pump and swim in through there. Which is terrifying. Yeah. I hate it and I love it. And so she swims down and as she swims down she sees a light rising from below. This giant light and she realizes what it is that everybody has been missing and i don't think i'm gonna fully spoil this we'll get to it in another like 20 pages well i mean even then i don't think i'm gonna spoil it fully then fair i'll get a blue balls everyone who's listening to this instead we just spoiled everything else about this book we're not gonna spoil that you're gonna have to go read it yourself or look it up <laughs> take that so she swims down and Jacques prowls the deck, grieving as he does, probably maybe murdering somebody, or yeah. he's just kind of shooting indiscriminately. He's looking for something to kill him, is what he's doing. Anything that is moving, he shoots. He does not stop to see if it's human or siren. This passage here really exemplifies the way that Mira Grant does more with less in terms of violence on the page, because there is no description of the gruesome, gory, rending, tearing way that he absolutely would have died here. There's just the absence. The thrashing mass of sirens writhed atop his body, their hands rending him into pieces. In the end, he was barely a mouthful for each of them. Those who had survived the encounter slithered on, lips bloody, bellies empty, looking for something more to kill. The next chapter begins with Daryl and Gregory celebrating the fact that the shutters are finally working. They stay with Olivia to be in the bridge should anyone respond to their distress call. One of them slightly more willingly than the other. <laughs> Tori makes it down to the pump and is glad that she's going to be swimming into it, mostly because she wants to escape from the mass of glowing light rising from below. This is where the twist comes through, and I'm not going to tell you. If you're a nerd, you've probably figured it out. She gets stuck at the end, right before she can escape. Across the ship... Olivia realizes, while booting up some systems, that the mermaids that have been stuck aboard the ship now are starting to slowly die from exposure, from being on the surface too long. Then she notices, from one of the cameras, Tori struggling against the latch that's keeping her in. She calls on the loudspeakers, asking if anyone can save her. And Hallie goes out despite Dr. Lennox really trying to discourage her from doing it. I love that exchange, and I'm going to read a little bit of it because it's very clever. How do you know? If it was one of your sisters, you'd lie to have a chance at saving her. You're right. I would. Hallie started for the door. Just like, fuck, man. So she gets out there and saves Tori and by extension saves them all because of what Tori has realized. And Tori tells them how to stop what's coming. Why everyone aboard the Atagatis died. They live. They manage to drive yeah. off what is coming. And it's interesting. I think that the end of this book feels too quick 
to me. Like, I... <laughs> of course you're gonna don't agree. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, the whole final half hour of the timeline of this book is stretched out over the course of at least 50 pages. I still just feel like the end is a little bit too quick, but that is just my opinion. Yeah. And I feel like some of the stuff at the beginning could have been cut for more time at the end, is how I feel. <laughs> and you're going to disagree with that, and that is okay. I don't know what you could say at the end here that would add more depth to the finale that would be worth cutting part of the beginning. They're rescued by a military ship, and the mermaid they have captive is delivered to Imagine. Mm -hmm. Imagine comes out victorious in this. They're the ones who get what they want, and that's a hell of an ending. And it ends with Victoria and Olivia curled up sleeping together. Sleeping, but not sleeping peacefully. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a good note to end on. They're not all right, and... Yeah, they're never gonna be all right. And that's a hell of an ending. And Orbit Books, release out of the swallowing sea. <laughs> so, that was our first book. It was our first book. It's... You chose a good one to start on. <laughs> Thank you. I managed to choose one of your favorite authors. <laughs> you did. And I didn't even have to twist your arm. <laughs> so now we should get into our rating system. The Dex rating system. We decided that each of these would be what we consider key parts of these books. Dialogue and characterization. How well the authors deal with writing the dialogue. How well they flesh out the characters. Yeah. Individual character voice. Your and lore, which I definitely stretched a little bit, but that is the world building of whatever book series how fleshed out the world building itself is. Keys of writing is technical skill, grammar and spelling, and the way that the book is structured. And also some opinionated stuff beyond that. Do we like how this style of writing is? Enjoyment of book, how much we enjoyed the experience. Pretty standard. That right. one makes sense. And then my favorite, slurability. Of course that's your favorite. <laughs> If this book was walking down the street, how likely is it that someone would shout a slur at it? <laughs> Essentially, is this book particularly queer because we're interested in queer media and how well is the queerness presented? So, we're rating these out of eight for the Gilbert Baker Pride flag. One for every stripe. How would you rate for each of these categories? Dialogue and characterization. So here's the thing. Shauna McGuire slash Mira Grant is my favorite author, so I'm trying really hard not to be biased in how I rate this book. <laughs> Dialogue and characterization, I would say seven, even trying not to be biased. I think character work is one of her strongest points as an author. I absolutely agree. That is one of her strengths, how she writes characters and how her characters interact. I agree. Seven out of eight. Yore and lore. This one, there's not as much depth to the magic or the science fiction to get into as some of the other things we're probably going to be talking about because I love genre fiction. We're going to be reading a lot of genre fiction. But what there is is really solid. Another thing that I like a lot about Shauna McGuire's work is the amount of research she puts into presenting a plausible science when she writes science fiction. So I think I'm going to give this one a six. It's set in the real world, in a slightly futuristic real world. I like what there is. I think it's all very well researched, especially some of the lore around mermaids throughout history. I am probably going to rate this a five. Interesting. Keys of writing. So there aren't really any errors in this book to dock points. Well, there's a couple of copy editing errors we found. And this is published through a big traditional publishing house, so they don't have an excuse. But I'm not going to dock points for that. The main thing that interests me in terms of technique with this book is the way that she uses point of view. 
and especially the way that she switches between them, which is something you can only really do in third person like this. And it's very interesting to me because the majority of her work is written in first person, so it's nice to get to see her use that extra space. And I do also like some of the techniques that she uses, some of her specific quirks of writing, like mm -hmm. I was discussing with the snappy endings to chapters that really pull you into the next. I think this, again, I'm probably biased. I want to give this a seven. <laughs> I'm going to give it a six. You're just being contrary at this point. I'm not being contrary. Yes, you are. Enjoyment of book. And this is the point where I get to be unabashedly biased. And this is where it's going to be interesting because, well, as I said, Shauna McGuire is my favorite author. This is actually one of my least favorite books from her body of work. Which is not to say that it's bad, just that her other work is even better and you should go read it. So I'm only going to give this one a five. <laughs> oh, wow. I really enjoy how this is written. I enjoy a lot of what she does with this. And like, I really enjoyed reading it. I like the suspense. I like mm -hmm. the tension it built up throughout it. I disagree with some parts of it, but I would rate this a six. Fair. Slur ability. The book does contain textual queerness. We have a lesbian and a bisexual woman as our main surviving couple in a horror novel, which is quite groundbreaking. The gays survive through the slasher! <laughs> but overall, this is not really a book that's about queerness. The romance is kind of incidental to the plot. Only gonna give this one a three. A three? It's still really well done. Mm -hmm. I agree that it's incidental to the plot. It's not a main focus of the plot. It is really well written, though. Yeah. This is a book that contains queerness, but is not about queerness. Yeah, it's about the slasher. It's about yeah. the horror. The queerness is just on the side. I'm going to also say three. No, I'm going to say four. Because it's well-written, and we're not always going to cover well-written queerness. No, we're not. So I want a lot of room to go down from here. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I The only reason I really gave it a three is because it's both incidental, and there are only two textually queer characters in a very large cast. Fair. Any final thoughts for this? Orbit books give me out of the swallowing sea. I love the theming throughout the book. Yeah. Sean McGuire does so much with themes and echoing themes and rhymes. Mm -hmm. And I mm. love that. Also, more horror media should be set in places like cruise ships because that is genuinely a terrifying place you can't escape from. Any books that this reminds you of? Anything that it brings to mind? In terms of things we probably won't cover because they aren't queer, the Newsflash series, which you should go read, but is rough because she basically called out the CDC response to COVID. Four or five years in advance. Yeah. Something that we are probably going to cover at some point is Aliens Echo, which is are her short story novella, novel. It's a novella. Book. Yeah, it's a novella. Paragraph. It's one of these. <laughs> a novella that she wrote set in the Aliens universe, and it has a lot of similarity to this, and how she writes horrific monsters tearing through people. It's great. I love it. I <laughs> want to cover it here at some point. Absolutely, we can cover that. I have a lot of things to say about that one. If you want more horror stuff with autistic characters, there's another book that we're going to cover eventually called Hell Followed With Us. That's more supernatural than science fiction, but yeah. But it is very good and a very rough read because it is very raw, but like in a very good cathartic way. And of course, check Tingle's Camp Damascus, which also features a queer autistic protagonist in a horror setting. Which I have not read yet, and I want to. We'll read it for the podcast. Yep. So that wraps up this episode of Dykes on Books podcast. So now for some quick bookkeeping. Talison, it is your pick next week, so tell us what you chose. Next week we will be reading Sweet and Bitter Magic by Adrian Tooley. And just to give you a taste, here's the blurb from the inside cover. Tamsin is the most powerful witch of her generation. 
but after committing the worst magical sin, she's exiled by the ruling coven and cursed with the inability to love. The only way she can get those feelings back, even just for a little while, is to steal love from others. Ren is a source, a rare kind of person who's made of magic, despite being unable to use it herself. Sources are required to train with the coven as soon as they discover their abilities, but Ren, the only caretaker to her ailing father, has spent her life hiding in secret. When a magical plague ravages the queendom, Ren's father falls victim. To save him, Ren proposes a bargain. If Tamsin will help her catch the dark witch responsible for creating the plague, then Ren will give Tamsin her love for her father. Of course, love bargains are a tricky thing, and these two have a long, perilous journey ahead of them. That is, if they don't kill each other first. So if that's something that catches your interest, go ahead and pick that up before our next episode. Now, last little bit of housekeeping. Last but not least. If you like our podcast, you can follow us on social media. We are Dykes on Books Podcast on Tumblr, Twitter, and Blue Sky. We will not be calling it X because that's stupid. If you would like to get in contact with us, you can email us at dykesonbookspod at gmail.com. And if you would like to support the show, you can find us on Patreon as Dykes on Books Podcast. You can find us on there. Toss us a little bit of money if you really like this show. We're just getting started, so things are a little bit wonky still, but we're going to be picking up fairly quickly, I think. We're still deciding what kind of prizes you get for supporting us, but forcing us to read terrible books is on the table. (laughs) Yes, that will be one of our goals for the future. Well, as always, be gay, do grammar crime. Someday we'll come up with a good tagline.